often and I want to talk to you about lunch. Let's face it, lunch breaks are so important to us right now, so we really should be making the most of them. For me, you can't be a lovely walk with the dog. Or maybe a bit of lunchtime gaming? Or perhaps an hour on the bike? But recently, I've been really cooking up some lovely lunchtime recipes. Well now, I've got something new for my lunch break, and you're all invited. Join me, plus a special guest, for The Late Lunch, where we'll be discussing everything from amazing customer stories to delicious lunchtime recipes. So let's see who will be joining us this week. everybody and welcome to The Late Lunch with me, Simon Johnson, where we take a unique view into the world of CX and customer service and customer support, all from the comforts of your own home and hopefully with a little bit of lunch to share. As you know, CX is, is, a, is, is often a very difficult topic, it's a huge topic, quite nebulous, um, and, and in these sessions we're going to try and bring a little bit of clarity, and of course with the help of an expert each week. As well as um, great debate and discussion around some of the, 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 the topics within CX, we'll also be um, running a quiz, uh, as we always do. Uh, this will be our fourth um, entry into the quiz, uh, which we're calling the CX Champions League, which is no European Super League breakaway, I can assure you. Um, and <laughs> we will be um, sharing all of the questions from, um, from the many people that are joining us today. Um, and first, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody for supporting our efforts in in, in, in promoting the, the late lunch, which we hope will give a, a little bit of different views. So, intros. Um, so, as you know, each week I'm, I'm joined by um, uh, uh, a professional, uh, an expert, and an advocate, of course, in the CX world. And today we're joined by Martin Hill Wilson. So, Martin, good morning. Good Hello, afternoon. Simon. Thank you very much for inviting me on your special show. Real privilege. Awesome. Um, well, great. Let's um, let's sort of get get to it then, shall we? We've got probably about. 25 minutes or so, and we'll, um, yeah. we'll try and keep firing through as much as we can. Uh, no pressure on the quiz, by the way. Um, it, it, it's okay. I'll, I'll show you the scores a little bit later, but I think you've got a, a good opportunity to go top of the league here. Ah, oh, great. Okay. Um, perfect. All right. So um, before we start, um, are, are you eating lunch or do you choose? Uh, I have a, a, I've got a, a miso uh, concoction. Keep you going. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Well, I, I actually feel a little bit of a fraud today because today's actually um, our Ocado day, uh, which arrives at about half past four. So I'm I'm very much going in with whatever I can find in the fridge. Basically, <laughs> yeah. is my is my combo. So, okay. Well, let's um, let's get on to, to to this subject then, and let's let's tackle this massive area of automation because I think yeah. that's that's really key. Over the past 12 months, um, we've seen more and more advances in CX as companies try their hardest to catch up and differentiate, if you like, through the service that they're delivering. Um, and I think automation is, is, is one of those areas that's probably seen um, quicker than most um, uh, momentum and, and growth, basically. So, so let's just um, focus there for a second. And I'm, I'm keen, from your perspective, really, just to talk through some of the things you've seen, like, you know, you know some some of the kind of marquee automations that have been um, that have been released by companies. Mm. Well, I, th I think you're quite right. You know, let's go back to the thing. Live assistance was pretty much overwhelmed. Uh, we had to push the button on finding other ways of, of still helping customers. I have to say, by the way, that there's still far too many instances of people hoping, uh, you know, or, or still, you know, uh, services slow. We apologise twelve months in. So I think that's a, that's a very poor. Uh, example, I think IKEA was uh, kicked in the teeth only a couple of days ago by the Financial Times or somebody as far as that's concerned. So that that turned yeah. up as, as a topical kind of a thing. Um, but basically, uh, bots, if they work, that's fine. Um, if I can get my stuff done in, in an automated way, I've increasingly been um, getting my health stuff done through a couple of apps, which have connected me into my doctors. You know, I've been able to um, get uh, health appointments done without them needing to go to the surgery. That's been cool. I've yeah, been to order stuff. That's all worked. Um, it's not too difficult. I've suddenly discovered <laughs> health records I didn't know exist. They gradually got 
put put into the system. So I'm pretty positive about that stuff. You know, that's all uh, pretty good. Um, and I think the stuff they've done around COVID, quite frankly, is just fantastic. You know, yeah. if you think about that, they've they've done a great job about that, making that real time, making that fairly simple uh, at the end of the day. I think most people that have done um, um, click and collect, you know, have done that pretty quickly. And most e-commerce now, that's become standard fare, really, hasn't it? You know, the fact is that you can do it online, just knit around the shops, and it's it's pretty much available as and how you want it. I think that's done a fantastically important connection and bridge between those two worlds. And I think that will that will continue after because the underlying thing is why did we do it? The answer is A, because we had to, which is what's accelerated it all. But I yeah. think it comes down to the convenience of it. And I think going forward, that's an extra option for us. You know, if it's not that much of a deal and it's just a real matter of convenience, let's do exactly that. Um, you know, I trust that white van to turn up anything up to midnight, basically, and it pretty much does most of the time, you know. So I order online and then it turns up and I'm fine with that. Or it could be in store if I want to collect it somewhere else and all of those bits and pieces pretty much work. I think the only slight blip from a UK perspective is we've had some confusion about if we're ordering from mainline Europe, that's sometimes been slow. Some people have turned up with an extra tariff on top and been pretty freaked out by that, quite frankly. And that's been a bit of a bit of an upsetting thing. Um, but that that part of life, I think, uh, has has worked very well. And when it does work well, I think to make one of the points we want to get into today, when things work, I have trust, <laughs> unsurprisingly. So if you make things effective, and I would say that applies to any form of interaction, whether it's got humans involved or it's automated, people end up trusting you if they fail you end up with a, a question mark. And if you do it lots of times, people just don't trust you as being competent. And that applies as much to a live channel as it does to an automated one. Yeah, well, it's it, companies are very um, <clears throat> very quick to be written off if they lose that trust, whereas it's actually really hard to get that trust in the first place. So let's sure. just sort of fo focus on that because there's, there's obviously lots of different types of trust there. And you've, you've mentioned as well, you know, the, the whole business around managing health online. I mean, that's a huge trust issue, but that's a sort of diff different different part of trust. But uh, what, what do you think are the steps really that, that um, uh, uh, companies need to be able to take to gradually build that trust that we're talking about? Right. Well, uh, if you go back uh, to our priorities, which I don't think have changed, it's got to be quick. It's got to be efficient, minimum effort. You know, don't ha harass me. Make sure it's customize to my needs, don't make me go back to go uh, and get me to the outcome with the least channel hopping you can. Let's just say that's pretty much what you see in most surveys. Um, I would say that that's the core expectation against which you get judged in the first instance. So within that context, I would say the first thing that I probably notice is uh, how easy is it for me to do business with you, whether or not that's just in a service context or a sales context. You know, is it obvious? Is it easy? Are my preferred ways of, of interacting hidden from me or made available? So that would be one of my first signs. Um, some people, for example, might remember traumatic IVR. They might now go, this new damn digital bot is exactly the same experience I had of IVR. I feel blocked. I don't feel enabled. So I yeah. think that's that's very early on in the journey where we begin to feel, oh, I'm not so sure about this. Then I think the next thing is how easy is it for me to be understood um, in terms of what I want? And again, I want you to, the best of that is you anticipate, right? The next is we have a fairly simple interaction where you understand me pretty much first time and then I get to the right place, right time. The worst one is it's confusing and I need to speak to someone for real or I get to somebody for real and that's not the right person and I have to start again you know, with another person. So that's another point of, you know, the, a moment of truth uh, as, as far as that's concerned. Um, and then I think the whole damn thing just needs to be simple. You know, uh, far too many processes remain for the benefit of the brand, not for the benefit of the customer. And yeah. simplification, you know, getting rid of complexity. And I think we have mastered a lot of that. And I think as we automate it, it gets exposed. And I think that we as consumers feel much more irritated, much faster. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. And I just want to pick up on one point you make there, because this is one of my massive pet hates here, which is why are we actually adding automation? Like, are we adding it because 
the the company thinks well, that's the right thing to do. We need to reduce the number of agents we have, whatever it may be. Or are we actually doing this to make service delivery better? And sure. I think that we have to we have to remember that this is actually for the benefit of the customer and the client, not for the benefit of the of the company. Um, well, let's, do, um, let's, let's say that again because it is absolutely worthwhile. What is your motivation for for, for doing any of this kind of a stuff? And it has to be, unfortunately, outside in, if it's going to be effective, it has to be on the behest of the customer. But often we have to invest, we have to justify investments from an internal perspective. So often, I mean, I think we, we were chatting a few days ago and saying how suspicious we were of language like deflection, because deflection doesn't sound like my interests have been served. <laughs> it sounds like I'm doing something. Yes, deflected you. <laughs> That's right. You know, and I, I have a very simple thing, by the way, which I think is absolutely the case. If you're going to offer something in an automated context, where, albeit where it's purely an FAQ or a conversational AI, whatever you want, put live assistance right next to that ex that offer, because if it actually works for the customer, they're not going to escalate. They're not going to want to speak to a person because what you've done is deliver something that serves their interest there. It's going to work. If you get lost of escalation, it's because what you've offered is either inappropriate and I still need a human or the way you've designed it is rubbish and I need to speak to somebody. So there's a real test there, which is do you trust a customer and their needs or do you think you know better? And that's still, to your point, a major point of issue. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I was going to um, I was going to mention that, actually. Um, I remember talking to Adrian Swinsco and, and he, 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 he spoke about this kind of muscle memory thing. Yes. You can't just build and they will come. You have to, you almost have to learn how to provide automation as an organization, you know, and, and, and some of the better performing companies that we have been working with, you know, somebody specifically in charge of that role, you know, chief automation. How do we oh, yeah. put automation in place in the right way? And it, it starts right at the root, which is knowledge management. You know, there's, yep. there's yep. no point. And it's very frustrating when you're pushed towards uh, a self-service solution only to find out the self-service solution is a knowledge-based article that's a year out of date, for example. That's a cl classic idea. Um, well, I would say one thing which is interesting with automation, what you're actually doing is you're deconstructing a human-to-human -human conversation. Yes. And that's a very good place to start. If you've never done it before as an organization, I know it's you might think it's a day wasted, but to actually spend some time observing two people going having a chat, you'll notice that there's constant checking, there's constant compensation, there's constant revision of what our intent is. And it doesn't actually go from A to Z. It glides as it moves through. And automation is attempting to replicate all of the things that humans do quite naturally. Uh, and of course, if you've got something like knowledge article one year out of date, and you've said that is the way that we want you to get that particular problem resolved, clearly that's going to lead to dissatisfaction, escalation, sitting in a queue, starting again, low CSAT. It's just a point of failure. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious if you bother to get underneath the skin of what the customer really wants. But most people don't. They believe in the tech. They don't actually think about the need of the customer and how much more difficult it is, by the way, to deal with those other things like knowledge, like channel choice and all those other things if a human isn't there to make those decisions. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I'll just um, uh, just comment for everybody listening in today. And please do post any questions that you have for, um, for Martin and myself, and we'll, um, we'll tackle them as we go along. I'm sure there's a, there's a ton of questions out there. Um, so let's, let's just sort of move into how, how we make these kind of um, uh, improvements and as an organization. Um, if we think, um, uh, you know, things move at the speed of trust, basically, rather than the speed, yeah. of, uh, speed of sound. It's the speed of trust. So how do, you, how do you go about building that trust over time? Because it, it doesn't just, you know, it's not just there. So what what, what, what advice have you got on those first couple well, of steps? I, okay, I mean, I would take it research. I was just mugging up some stuff to find the evidence for the answer to that kind of question. And uh, Joe Colson done some good work on this recently okay. uh, and said trust is directly correlated to getting the job done, in essence. Yeah. Uh, which makes perfectly good sense. Deliver me the things that matter to me, quality of service, reliability, transparency, personalization, and I develop trust over time. Bruce Temkin, same stuff, global survey. Uh, again, trust is directly correlated with um, me delivering what you want. And if I do it over time, so you earn it by being reliable in relationship to the priorities of the customer. So it's not a magical ingredient. It's not something you win by, you know, um, you can't buy trust in that sense. You can only earn it 
And as you say, you can probably lose it much quicker than you can earn it at the end of the day. And I think we also, by the way, which is which is to be taken into due account, there are many, many uh, negative influences that make trust quite precarious. So we live in a world, for example, online, where we fundamentally do not trust information. We do not trust news. Uh, it's very difficult. I just had a call this morning, for example, being told I was going to be taken to court. I decided to push one and I listened and I was told it was HMRC. I said nothing. I heard some weird noises in the background and they and they stopped within 10 seconds. Wow. You know, now, that's a fraud call. Uh, I know yeah. I know Pauline, you know, over at Action Fraud and she's been saying that there's been a 30, 40 percent growth over the pandemic as far as uh, fraud is concerned. I have an instinct having done some work in that space, to know that particular thing. So I fundamentally don't trust that. You know, I fundamentally don't really trust organizations, interestingly, that take my data and I don't know what's going on with it. You know, I'm suspicious of that at the end of the day. Um, and indeed, to make it topical, it's interesting the conversation that Tim Cook is having right now on behalf of Apple in court, talking with with Epic, you know, who produce Fortnite. Course, yeah. And, and that's a very interesting conversation because his predicate is you can trust us if we can take complete control of the software, the hardware, the environment within which we do it, because we will look after your concerns for privacy, et cetera, at the end of the day. And if you break that ecosystem, you break our ability to manage trust. And that's really his defense, which is a very interesting uh, defense. You know, and they've always actually tried to have AI, which is localized to the device. It doesn't have to go to the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that we have got to a point, whether or not we just recognize our details have been nicked yet again. It's another one this week of, I think there was an airline this week. Was it the end of Friday? One of the airlines, Ryanair again or somebody? No, actually, I'm not going to say that. I don't know who it was. Uh, but somebody has lost customer data yet again. And so we live in a world where we really can't trust stuff at the end of the day. Elections have been won or lost at the end of that. So within that general environment of us rightly being cynical and suspicious, um, we have to build the fact that we are reliable and you can trust us at the end of the day. So I'd say it's an uphill battle. Uh, and, and the other thing to do is to also look at it in the context, I think, of the last 12 months. We are much, much, much more suspicious, anxious. And when your brain is in that space, you tend to see much more danger and threat than you would do if you were in a more chilled zone. So fundamentally, everybody's a little bit more suspicious. Have you noticed the last time when you walk down the street, the people embrace each other? We're not allowed to do that, Norga. Have you noticed the way that people stop and walk around with each other on the street? That again is healthy, but is also another way of expressing, I'm not quite sure who you are at the end of the day. So building trust in the environments that we find ourselves in is a much more difficult thing to do. And it only takes the one thing like not being sensitive to customers, not being sensitive to employees, being crass about opening times or whatever it is, and you can lose that trust extremely simply. Yeah, it, it also does um, some really interesting um, points. That it, it really does make make you wonder, you know, what effect it'll have on the you know the generation coming up. You know, I mean, I I, I have um, I have two sons, of which one of them is um, constantly on Fortnite, and I've I've actually received several emails from Epic Games um, uh, offering me money back, basically, um, right. which is done to every user, um, tens of millions, basically. Um, uh, so, so there obviously there is a problem, but it does make you wonder, you know, the generation coming up, you know, how they perceive trust versus ourselves, who, are, who have been brought up in a very different, you know, environment of, you know, automation, which is just a very new thing. Yes, yes. Well, I think there's different there's different challenges. I mean, my my daughter, eleven, it's always the same. And me with my my own parents, you know, you're savvy in terms of the new things that turn up in life in a way that the previous generation is, is ignorant and a bit naive, you know, at the end of the day. So, you know, Cara can discern, for example, you know, what's real and what's not real on, on TikTok in a way that I can't. And she can disambiguate the stuff that's said about on DNI very, very carefully and very, very cleverly. Um, yeah. and, and she's highly sophisticated. And yet as a parent, I could very easily go in and said, TikTok is a bad thing you should not be on. You should not use that as your sole, you know, sole news source. But she's far more discerning. Uh, as a result of that, because that's the culture, that's the environment that her generation's grown up in. And, you know, I think humans basically have this very strong instinct to survive. And one of the things to survive is not being conned, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. You know, at the end of the day. Interestingly as well, um, 
you know, the, the growth of, of those new channels, of, of which you probably wouldn't expect them to be um, a, a form of kind of customer communication. But TikTok is, is becoming big. You know, that, that's going to be the next Huge. area that, you know, we're, we're getting asked by clients, will you, will you be supporting TikTok? You know, yeah. obviously we, yeah. we already support Facebook and, and WhatsApp and, and these other messaging platforms like Telegram and Line and, and all these other ones. So there's, there's a ton of new things coming out. In, Instagram is another one where you wouldn't expect to have to support customers through that channel, but it's... It's yeah, just um, very, very, very. Well, the other, the, so, so the other side of that, I mean, whilst we're talking about trust, uh, let's talk about Trust Pilot, and more generally, let's talk about online reviews, um, and that's another area where you know we, we've had this mantra, haven't we, now for a good decade, which is that we trust those who are like us more than we trust brands to tell us what to buy and what not to buy, and of course that's led to the whole um, gamification um, of online reviews, uh, and you know you listen to the problems that people like Amazon have got and the number of people and the huge amount of AI tech they've got to try at scale to find out what's real and what's not real and, and, and keep things as clean as possible. But that's a huge, huge, huge area. Um, and so constantly, you know, we are seeking to do the right thing. And yet as soon as it, particularly in a, in a digital world, the speed at which something can get gamified, destroyed, and the, and the dark side of something can come up is extremely strong and that must eventually get reflected in a kind of um, instinct for being a digital human <laughs> you know, you know, living in a digital age you yeah. just get a sixth sense of what's real and what's not real and how you double check things and and how you do that at the end of the day but coming back to the point organizations oh by the way there's an interesting stat as well from that piece of colson research which is very few people actively measure trust. So here's a question to our audience today. Does your organization measure trust? Hmm. You know, and, and I second, know, thing how. That, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, uh, how are you going to do that? But have you got any parameters on the degree of trust that you got? There's an interesting stat, by the way, which you might be interested in. Ed Edelman, who does this stuff, the trust monitor stuff, yeah. said that if the um, if somebody doesn't trust the brand, then, uh, you know, very few of that, of that customer base will believe what an organization says. If they do trust the brand, the majority will believe what a customer, what, what a brand says after a couple of times of stating it. So in other words, the context of trust absolutely frames whether or not something is credible or it's considered to be non-credible at the end of the day. So that's an interesting point. If you lose that credibility, you know, you are in real trouble and there are so many opportunities to lose that in today's world. And and yeah, and and uh, as well as the credibility piece, it's of course stickiness with customers. And you know, can, can you actually keep your customers in a world where it's so easy to move from product to product to product in the yeah. SaaS world that we, that we live in? Anyway, it's been a, an absolutely amazing conversation. Thank you. We could probably keep going on this for at least another hour, I think. But um, we, we need to we need to call it a halt and and head into the um, head into the yeah, quiz. Sure. No problem. Which I'm. Um, super excited about so uh, uh 90 seconds quick fire just to okay give you, just give you a rough idea you may be able to see here some swins some code four uh dawkins Do eight colson six right well i'm okay. gonna actually i'm gonna either go for 10 or for two all right <laughs> e e either side then right so I'll, I'll set my um my timer for 90 seconds and we'll go straight in Okay. okay. So question number one: What is the full form of UI and UX? Uh, user interface and, and user experience. Correct. Question number two: This month, which high street bank was described by customers as a nightmare, with people being un unable to pay for petrol or payments being rejected? Ah, uh, yes. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Santander. Yes. On a roll. Nice. Uh, question number three, um, May saw the return of some signs of normality in the UK with supporters attending the FA Cup final, of course. Who won that final? Uh, that that was won by Man City. Incorrect. Leicester City. It was Leicester. I knew Leicester. that. I knew that. Go uh, what, does, what does NPS stand for? Uh, Net Promoter Score. Correct. Um, Churn is the percentage of customers who stopped using your company's product or service. True or false? Correct. It is correct. You're right. Uh, question number six. Which US-based fitness brand 
announced an urgent product recall after warnings that the touch screens on their treadmills may become loose and fall off. I can't pronounce it, but it begins with P. It's something like Paragon. <laughs> Controversial one. It's Peloton. Peloton. There you go. This, Peloton. This, yeah. Very, very yeah. close. Uh, okay. 70% uh, of customers say that brand trust influences their buying decision. True or false? True. True. It is true. Oof. Okay. Uh, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're hinged, basically. So I think we should have one more. I'm up for it. We should have one more. Okay. Uh, when companies prioritize CX, they can charge a premium of up to 16%. Is that true or false? Correct. You're right. It's true. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, what, how do you think you did? Well, by the sounds of it, I might actually have uh, got to the top of the leaderboard. I don't know. You, you scored... Let's have a look. Whoa! Oh! Oh! <laughs> I beat my James by one point. You're, you're nestled between Joe and James. Okay, well, that's interesting. Well done, James. Yeah. Good. Very good. Congratulations. That was um, thank you very much. Yeah, that was cool. decent actually. Okay. Right. Let's um, let's move on to some um, some questions then as we um as as yeah. we finish things up. So we've got a question here from Adam Lissick. Um, hi Martin. Um, just on the examples you mentioned there. Uh, is that automation or is it an interface to viewing your data, placing an order? Uh, so I think what Adam's yeah, asked that question, I don't quite get it. Yeah. So I think uh, the question is around. Um, uh, is that automation? Um, Adam, can you re-explain it? I'll answer it if I if I get some more clarity on what you're asking there. Uh, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll make, maybe I'll reword it. So, so I think the question is around um, when we automate. Um, you know, uh, how how do we sort of show that data? What, what 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 do we get to the? How do we present all of that data to the customer? I, I think is the is the question. Uh, is that automation or is it just an interface to for viewing your? I, I, I think pr probably. Um, uh, there's, there's another. Could be. I'm not, I can't remember the example. Sorry. I'm, yeah, I, I can't remember what the example it was referring to. But, but no, no. never mind. Um, so uh, the, the next question is around. Um, uh, uh, we're talking about security. Like, um, yeah, what, yeah. what, what, what is how, what will make you feel, feel comfortable? I guess about you know uh, uh, logging in securely, or you know, you're using a chatbot. You know, what 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 sort of information do you feel comfortable with giving? Basically, uh, well, I, I feel comfortable with giving any inf information. Uh, well, if I answer the question, is it possible to automate security aspects? Absolutely right. Um, you know, I a biometrics. I'm pretty convinced by. Um, basically, two-factor authentication. The more forms you've got, uh, the better. Uh, I do think, by the way, you should also try to have consi consistent real-time authentication, which is interesting if you get into that detail. In other words, you're looking for patterns of behavior continuously through the interaction, and you build a profile of risk, and you intervene or you don't over time. I think that's the state of the art there. I think hiding it as much as possible. Well, actually, it's interesting. Some customers like it deliberate up front because it gives them a sense of security. And other people don't like the hassle and they just like it as a background thing. But basically, yes, it's entirely possible to make the whole thing completely secure. Got it. And then um, back, back to Adam's question. So Adam okay. was referring specifically around um, medical data. So um, oh, right. when you're looking at your um, medical yeah, data, yeah. are you actually looking for automated responses or are you just looking to see your data? Basically. No, sorry. But the, actually, I didn't put the context in there. I was just talking about a couple of apps that I've started using mm. um, and the fact that that has given me um, uh, a certain amount, well, visibility to my medical history and all that kind of good stuff. The the medication ordering is, I suspect, not entirely automated behind the scenes, but I don't have to make any further effort uh, in order for that to be magically turning up at my boots, you know, in a couple of weeks time, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm, you know, pretty pleased with that. The jab that I had, um, couple of, on Friday, actually, my second COVID jab has magically turned up, you know, so again, behind the scenes, um, th that there is a, a degree of, um, uh, I would pro probably process automation really at the end of the day taking place there. So yes, there are signs of that stuff there. Yeah. I'd, I'd agree with you on the, um, on, on, on the jabs, but it, it does feel like it's been run very well and, and, and yeah, automation right at the heart of it. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then just one, one final one, which is um, which is quite a chunky um topic. But um, let's let's uh, a, a question from Nitish. Um, let's say the company has done pretty well with automation. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're comfortable with where they've got to. They're providing a decent service. What next? How how do you build more trust? trust? Right. Well, go back to human. If you want to know how to do it, just look at your own experience in psychology. The best way to make trust is to be transparent. Yeah. I don't trust what I can't see if it's hidden behind a rock. Make it transparent. So be transparent on your use of data. Be transparent around of your capability on service if it's not good. Be transparent around of how you are with employees, with customers. Be transparent around of sustainability, those things that matter to customers. The more we know about you, the more we can form judgment, the more we can afford to trust you. And by the way, if you screw up, be honest. It's no, yeah. it's not, no more complex than that. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I'd agree, I'd agree with that. Um, and uh, just one from Ganapathy here, which which I'll, yeah. I'll answer quickly. So the question is around how much automation is too much. Well, if, if we just go back to, to some of Martin's points that he was making there, um, think about it from the customer perspective. Okay, what are they? What what value are they getting from the automation that you're adding, basically? And one one piece of advice that we always give to companies is just take take those top five or top ten inquiries that are coming in, and figure out how you can automate and actually add value to that process, and then just when work your way through. When it's a motive. Yeah complex matters to the state of the relationship keep it within the human domain build the rest up and there's a huge tranche you shouldn't be doing more than 25 percent of all inbound through live exactly perfect awesome on that note we'll um, we'll have to wrap it up because we've, we've run out of time but it's been a fascinating insight uh, martin really great thank to hear you. your views on this i really really enjoyed the session and Simon, thank, you. thank you very much for inviting me to lunch not, not at all. And th thank you, everybody, for, for joining in today. Um, yeah, I'm really proud that we were able to put a session on. All the best, everyone. See you next time.